you know, before we decide, I'd just like to check in with, with everybody. Is it going OK? Or you know, are there any sticking points? Is anybody done? I need to confess that I just tried to study the solution. The meal trust was the most efficient way to study. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I ran it, but I don't know what it is doing. So it runs something and says simulation stops after some steps. And yeah. Um, yeah, so, so um, one thing I wanted to do after you know, people finish coding up their adapters, let's go through and running it in different ways and have you guys try and do that from, you know, the start to the finish. Okay. By that meaning, like writing out some VTK data, opening up Paraview, generating the script. Um, so. Is there some more incremental way to do it? So that now we, we need to implement all the functions, but there is no way to test and give it more than yeah, true. There's no way to test individual functions, but you can in, you can write them one at a time and then compile and. Well, the compile first might not yeah, work. Usually, I do like that with the incremental. I do small functions, uh -huh. verify if it runs, check yeah. the results. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say you know write one function, compile, write one function, compile, and so on. The, the problem is the test. Yeah, testing. The problem is the testing. You the testing of you but, cannot. Output. Uh, I mean, the minimum would be to output VTK data on file on disk to verify that you you are passing the right uh, VTK structures. But until you have the the bridge and the data adapter written, you, you cannot write anything. That's yeah. a little bit the difficulty. Yeah. But they've got the bridge, so all they're doing yeah. is a data adapter. So um, actually, a couple of the functions are really trivial, right? There's one mesh. There's one array. So for there are four of the functions, what are there seven functions? There are four of them are really basically you know, return an integer or return a string. So those ones are good. Those don't need a lot of testing. The ones that you really care about are the get mesh, right, where you have to make the VTK object. Um, the best way to do that right, and debug that is try it, create the VTK object, but then there's a, a print function. So for all VTK objects, um, let's say you've got the mesh, right? And it's called mesh. Um, and then there's a capital print. And you pass it C error. And that will um, print VTK's idea of how it represents its internal structures to C, C error output. When mm -hmm. it does that, if you have any problems in your data set, it will crash. Um, and so that's a great place to attach a debugger. So if you get a crash during that print, you run it in GDB, and then you figure out what's going on. It's also useful, this, um, to see how your arrays look. Um, it will try and print out information about the arrays, like how many elements there are, what the min and the max are. And so that's very useful if it all looks good there then you can have pretty good confidence. And then, um, yeah, so that's I, how I will approach it as far as, the, as far as the data array, for example, one very simple check is to make sure that the number of tuples, that's what it's called in uh, VTK uh, parlance, uh, the number of tuples is equal to the product of your dimensions. So. Make sure that for each of the sub partitions, the product of your extents, we will also use the word extents, is equal to the number of tuples, so the size of the double array that you allocate. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you to, to, uh, to give a name to that VTK data array. And mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, printing, as Berlin suggested, will also print the data arrays. So you, it's, it's rather n nice to debug in that, in that particular fashion. Now, for the, for, the, for the mesh, we've seen that you have to do extent, spacing, and origin, all right? The spacing can be pretty trivial, one, one, one everywhere, and you're done. The origin is not so difficult. You know that you have four blocks 
uh, we run the case with four, yeah. We have four blocks, each of those blocks is offset from the zero, zero origin by the size of those dimensions along the x-axis or the y-axis. But you sh with the extents though, if you're giving it the actual extents, then you shouldn't have to mess with the origin either. Uh, you, actually, you, yeah, you're right. If, if, you're, if yes. you're telling it, okay, so you have the second block, if you're telling it, okay, yes. it starts at 15 or yes. 16 or whatever, yes. then it will actually do the shifting. Yeah, so. uh, just to make sure you guys are, don't get confused by, by our two statements here. When you define a grid in general, a VTK image data, you could say origin is 0, 0, and the indices go from 0 to n minus 1, but you're not actually obliged to start from the index 0. You can start from index n and go to n plus m. So there's really the equivalent ways of describing one sub-region of a grid. You can either give it origin 0, 0, and an index which starts at an arbitrary number in space, mm -hmm. or you can offset the origin and your index starts at zero. Yes. Okay, is that, is that clear? Yeah. Uh, you will find, for example, if you load a multi-block data set in Paraview and then write it back as a PVTI or as a PVTS file, etc you will find those extents exactly written in that particular way. For each piece, there will be the extent offset like this. Yeah, now, now that you mention it, I'm not sure what is the right way with multi-block. In fact, you know, with a multi-block, either way is probably just yeah. as correct. When you're I'll talking have, about... So the examples I have uh, given yesterday in one of the uh, Python scripts, the V tk multi block zero dot pi mm -hmm. i implemented that using origin at zero zero i'll have to do the the reverse exercise to see that to make sure the <laughs> the the result is the same but i'm yeah. i'm pretty confident it is i'm pretty I, confident i think it will yeah. be the same i'm just not sure if there is a better you know yeah, from yeah. like the point of kit where what they think and how they intended okay. it to be used i'm pretty sure both will work okay. the same yeah um Try it. If you run into problem, yeah. uh, get get back to us. Yeah, I definitely think that you guys should try coding it and then run any debugger if you have any crashes. And you know, as soon as you have something coded up like the the you know get mesh and add array functions, basically the other ones you should be able to bang out pretty quickly. Once you have those going, you know, give it a run and um, we'll we'll see if we can debug it. What, what I would like to make sure to tell you before the end is that uh, we're going to close the session this afternoon, but please uh, get back to me, first of all. I don't want to, I mean, in Berlin, it's hard enough, trust me, to, with the nine hours of jet lag, to work to the same day on the same topic. Uh, so get back to me via email, okay? After the workshop closes uh, next week or next month, I can always help you to uh, go further with the, uh, the testing and your own implementations, okay? I don't want this to be just a two days of the year and then we forget about uh, yeah, and what we've learned. I'm open to you guys asking questions as well after the, the, the workshop ends. That's totally fine. It's also the yeah. first time this year, this uh, tutorial that we use the Perl Jacobi solve example. It can be improved, so we'll keep improving it. Okay, and perhaps thanks to your feedback. Or if you have a patch to make it better too. <laughs> <laughs> Please, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, great. Okay. If okay. you do, you know, stay in touch. And you know. That um, makes me, you know, I, after talking to you and um, Andreas also had questions about having backends, that maybe the tutorial should include developing a backend instead of just the data adapter. 
maybe the, you guys could have the choice, either write a back end or a data adapter. So could be improved in the future, maybe. I guess I wondered in my mind, like, OK, if anybody was wondering how you would actually get the extents for your image data blocks. And so that is actually stored inside of the class in these internal variables. So um, <clears throat> we've got the origin, the spacing, and the extents already stored for you guys inside these member variables in the class. You can use these member variables when you're constructing your image data for your multi-block grid. So you don't have to worry about actually computing those or figuring those out. I don't know if you guys noticed that. I apologize for not mentioning that sooner. So by the way, the extents there. Um, so the idea with this is to have the origin shifted by one ghost zone with down and to the left so that the actual mesh starts at 0, 0. And then these rank, rank x, rank y, this is um, the integer IDs given by MPI and its Cartesian domain decomposition. So this, for instance, is uh, rank 0 uh, x, rank y 0. This is rank 1 x, rank y 0. This is rank um, 0 x, um, rank y 1. And this is rank x 1, rank y 1. So that's how MPI Cartesian um, domain decomposition works. 0 0, 1 0, 0 1, 1 1. Um, so extent 0 is the x um, of the rank here. So we take the x from the MPI Cartesian um, extent and multiply it by bx. bx is the distance um, of the mesh, the number of points in the mesh. We're not counting the ghost cells. Um, and then the other numbers are basically to get um, the ghost zones of, of the patch to line up in the right spot so that the mesh is actually, the valid zones are actually not overlapping and they're touching in the right ways. And so if you just take a pen and paper, you can all work all of that stuff out. By the way, is it possible to use Sensei for four-dimensional data? Um, what's the fourth dimension? Another space. Another space. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know the VTK, what VTK has that, support for. Which is not careful. No, that's the domain, yeah. How general it is. You're limited somewhat by the VTK data objects, but if you can think of a way to represent that um, structure, you could actually make a new VTK data set. The only constraint you have is that it derives from VTK data object. So Yeah, you'd have problem with coordinates of your grid because the VTK model enables only x, y, z coordinates. However, as far as the scalar data, the data arrays, you can have multi-component arrays. Uh, they could be, so the vector array is a specialized version of the VTK data array with three components. That's the standard uh, vector array as we, as we think of it. But you can have, uh, for example, there's, there's a way to store image data as red, green, blue, and transparency. That's a four-component array called a scalar array with four components. So that's easy for the data side. For the mesh, for the coordinates, it's more tricky. And as Berlin suggested, if you could uh, force uh, Sensei to think that the first three coordinates are, are your first three axes, and then perhaps an additional scalar array is your fourth coordinates array, that would be, uh, that, I mean, that would be, that's something easy to implement. Then the visualization of it, <laughs> uh, you would have to use some brain uh, power to. Yeah, here's the to, thing, to you might end it. up having yeah, to have yeah. your own custom back end to yeah. visualize this or, or analyze it, because if you have a 4D data set, how does Catalyst know what to do with that? It probably doesn't have the algorithm to process it, right? Okay, I don't use target, I use uh, something else. Exactly. Visualization, but somehow it's 
Yeah, you're going to have to have your own, you know, back end. In that case, what, one thing you could do is just do something like for D and then public. So you derive a new class inheriting from deep VTK data object, and then you can actually pass your class through Sensei. Um, what goes in here is totally up to you, and it doesn't have to work with, it doesn't even have to work with VTK. It doesn't have to be a traditional image data. It doesn't have to be anything like that. You could have anything in there that you want, don't expect libsim and Catalyst to know what to do with it, but if you have an analysis adapter that knows how to deal with it, then you can pass it through Sensei that way. Something I was going to mention, actually. Uh, one way to do it would be, uh, would be, okay, since the coordinates as we know them, x, y, z, would not apply to your case, you could just simply define a one-dimensional array and then use only data arrays to specify both your the coordinates in your 4D space plus the additional true scalars and vectors associated. So use a multi-component array uh, of dimensions n by m by p by q, <laughs> for example. But for sure, then the visualization is going to be, it, ha it has to be custom. So has to be. Uh, the is not helpful at all. It would be useful as a storage. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's probably yeah. not the, the most adequate. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's basically you're putting it into VTK only to get it through the API because that's a yes. data model. Yeah. And then you know, in that case, I'm not so sure how much actually Sensei buys you, you know, yeah. in that case. This is, this is a good one to think about because, you know, one of the great things about Sensei is you can flip in between these different back ends, right? But if most of the back ends don't know how to handle your data, yeah, what's the, the advantage <laughs> of flipping between yeah. them? So you may lose that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You could do so, that too. in fact, back to the solution I suggested to only use data arrays as the initial storage, and then the filtering that you may that you propose to do hyperslab uh, slicing would transform would take three of those scalar arrays and transform them into coordinates array, and then use the rest. Uh, that, so that would be a projection from your n-dimensional space to 3D. Uh, but then again, you could do this with a simpler data structure. VTK might be an overhead to store the, the n-dimensional data and then do the filtering to 3D. You would, in that case, I guess you would implement your, your hyper, hyperspace slicing uh, as an external filter, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and, and this came up recently. We have um, some guys at the lab who are working on the Xscale project, and they were writing all of their filters in VTKM. So they did something like that, where they have this VTKM filter, but then VTKM doesn't have any rendering capabilities. So they want to process the, this data in mm -hmm. um, VTKM in their new filter using topological analysis, and then get the data out and render it. So within, they have a, a Sensei analysis adapter that you know, processes the data using VTKM filter. But then we just invoke a catalyst analysis and we pass in a data adapter wrapping you know, their result and to render it. So you can do stuff like that. You can chain these um, analysis adapters. You can call another analysis adapter from inside your analysis adapter. So in your case, you'd be taking that hyper plane and then passing it into something else. Can I have another question? 
Mm -hmm. Is it possible to run, to analyze uh, some older time step, but keep the simulation running? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you can cache the time steps. You're limited by the amount of memory you have. Um, so the autocorrelation um, mini app or oscillators plus autocorrelation does this. The autocorrelation actually has to cache some number of time steps um, to do its computations. Um, so there's an example of that, but you know, you're constrained by how many time steps you can actually physically hold in memory. So it's possible, it, it has some caveats. How do I control if, I, if I'm looking at the data in PowerView? Mm -hmm. And normally I would have only one button run simulation or stop simulation? Yeah, so true. So, so in this scenario, um, not all the features are going to work because this pair of you doesn't have that understanding of time. Um, in, in, so inherent in the GUI of pair of you, you can't go back in time in the, in the Catalyst GUI um, because I, I, think, I don't think they foresaw people you know, actually wanting to cache steps and going back. Um, but that doesn't mean you couldn't do it in a different analysis, in a custom analysis. Yeah. OK, so we're, we're getting short on time. And I know some people want to leave. So are there any other questions um, about the data adapter exercise? OK. So I think with that, we pause that for a second. And because we have somebody leaving early, we go on to the, the slide, back to the slide deck, finish up the talk. And then with the remaining time, we could either keep working on the data adapter or we could run through actually using it on the, the Jacobi app. Um, we'll come back um, and do that. Okay, so the in-situ costs and performance. So measuring the cost of in-situ, we have two questions. How much overhead um, is associated with the use of in-situ methods, uh, infrastructure, um, and does it change with um, varying levels of concurrency? And uh, you know, runtime is a concern as well as memory consumption. Um, a lot of simulations use a lot of memory, and so everyone's concerned about how much memory is. Um, so we, in these slides, we're going to look at the in-situ costs. But additionally, you could look at in-transit. Um, we also look at um, in-situ versus post hoc, which is your traditional method of writing stuff to disk, um, and look at things like time to solution. Um, so all of these results that we're presenting in this slide were published in 2016. And in that paper, there's a number of other analysis that um, are presented that aren't shown in the slide deck. Um, so the approach we take for these benchmarks, we're going to use our mini application, which is explained on the next slide. We use um, three different um, tasks. I will say a histogram computation is one. The autocorrelation is another. Um, and again, that's a temporal analysis that requires buffering multiple time steps. Uh, lastly, we're going to do a, two, a 2D slice out of a 3D volume. And with that slice, we're actually going to use the different backends, the visualization backends like Catalyst, LibSim. So their individual performance characteristics are captured to some extent. Um, For, for the in-transit, we, we bring in audios. Um, we want to measure the runtime and the memory footprint at varying levels of concur concurrency. And we analyze things um, according to classifications of a one-time cost or a recurring cost. And we did all of these runs at NERSC, which is the DOE supercomputing center in Berkeley. And it's a Cray XC. This is 
actually retired system now. Um, it's been upgraded. Um, that's what the CPUs were at the time. And we ran tests, um, 812 cores, 6,496 cores, and 45440 cores. Um, don't remember exactly why. I think that was to get the, the number of blocks to max um, the grid dimensions or something. Um, there was some constraint we were trying to match. You've seen this one before, the oscillators mini app. You can have these oscillators that are sinusoids damped by some decaying exponential. Um, the application itself requires no IPC. It's embarrassingly parallel. Um, we know exactly how much memory it uses because it's this really simple program. Um, it has two copies um, of the mesh. Um, and each rank has a copy. Um, each rank has you know, n cubed points. So um, we did runs for each of these different configurations. Um, and the configuration name is used in the following plots. So original means the mini app without Sensei. So just it's completely compiled out. Um, and the original is, has a um, hook. So when you turn Sensei off, it has um, another um, code that gets compiled that actually does a function call into the autocorrelation um, com computation. So the original means we're doing the same analysis. We're doing the autocorrelation or the histogram or whatever um, without using Sensei at all. So this is how you would do it without Sensei. The baseline um, has Sensei enabled. So you turn the Sensei flag on. But we're not going to do anything but just call the Sensei API. Inside Sensei, there's just no ops. The code's not going anywhere. Um, so there, the baseline measures the cost of the Sensei API itself. Um, the histogram configuration uses the histogram through Sensei. Um, this one doesn't involve any of the back ends like audio, slipsim, or catalyst, so it's a custom analysis. The autocorrelation is mini app sensei autocorrelation. Again, this isn't invoking libsim or catalyst, and you can compare it to the baseline in the original. Um, on last three ones are gonna involve the in situ infrastructures, the Catalyst, Libsim, and Adios. And so um, all of these um, compute a slice. Either the Adios one does the you know, data movement, computes the slice in the second job. Um, the Libsim and Catalyst do it in situ. So this is kind of just a subset of the results, but it, it gets the point across. The original, the original um, numbers are, are recorded here for the autocorrelation. In the original configuration, Sensei is completely disabled. We're doing autocorrelation with just a function call um, without using Sensei at all. Then we compare it to what you get when you're doing the autocorrelation with Sensei, and the costs are negligible, the differences are negligible. There are some slight differences, but on the time scale um, of the cost of the computation itself, it's very indistinguishable. Um, and then this is um, the probing of the memory to see how much memory overhead we, we've added. Um, again, there's really not much difference at all. It's visually indistinguishable. And that just reflects the zero copy nature of the interface. If you're not doing zero copy, then there is obviously going to be a cost. 
But in these cases, we implemented it with zero copy. We also looked at um, the in situ um, processing compared to the traditional post processing um, setups. So in the post, the post hoc or post processing configurations, the simulations dump stuff to disk. Um, and then to do the analysis, you have to read that back from disk and then perform the analysis. And potentially, you have to do another write to get your, your results out. Um, and then obviously, the in situ does everything in memory, and there's no disk I.O. involved. Um, so the, the study of, of the runs that were involved in this study, we actually use different numbers of cores in the, the simulation side and the post-processing side. Um, this, um, this actually reflects practice um, of using fewer nodes um, in post-processing. Um, so we're doing like weak scaling, and we want to measure the end-to-end -end cost, including the simulation writes, the post hoc read cost, and processing costs, um, and compare it to, to in situ. And look at the time to solution for 100 time steps. So in these runs, the baseline um, is the mini app with the addition of some I.O. code that writes um, the, the, the entirety of the simulation result or the mini app state to disk. And we did a couple of different I.O. methods. We used VTK, VTK I.O. and MPI I.O. Um, there were some, I don't know, there were some I.O. Um, results. MPI wasn't the fastest, but we're not I.O. experts. Um, weak scaling, we just increase the data set as the number of cores increases. And I.O. cost is very high at um, the larger runs because it's weak scaling. So we're, we're going up in data, data sizes as well. So in the mini app, um, the output of one time step for 812 cores was 2 gigabytes. And it took 0.12. You can see the number of gigabytes increasing, the number of um, seconds increasing. And after 100 time steps, the total data written is shown. So for 812, it was um, 2 tenths of a terabyte. It took 12 seconds. At the largest, the 45K, we got 12 terabytes in 900 seconds. So that, that I.O. is very expensive. So. This chart shows the um, read, process, write overheads for different, so histogram, auto correlation, and pair view slice. Um, so this is the post-processing runs again. So we're doing this you know, after the data has been written to disk. We're reading it back in and doing the, the analysis. Um, so you can see reading, processing of the article correlation. Uh, same up here, reading, processing of a slice very fast compared to reading and writing. At any rate, so the autocorrelation at the 45K, it took over 2,000 seconds. Um, if you look at the pair view slice, the 45K, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 4,000, 4, uh, 4K. 4K core runs took over 500 seconds. The histogram took um, about 250 uh, seconds, it looks like, on the largest runs. So with the in situ um, time to solution for the same problem set, the times were much faster. Um, So 
So the, lar the largest one was you know, about 220 seconds for autocorrelation at 45K. Um, when we looked at that with the post-processing, it's over 2,000 seconds. So there, there is a big performance you know, benefit for, for doing in situ when you have a large amount of data that you're trying to show up to disk. And the result pretty much held across all of the use cases. So this just summarizes those results. The histogram in situ was 40 seconds approximately, over 1,000 with the post hoc when you include the total costs. Um, Autocorrelation, 225 in situ, almost 3,000 seconds. Um, in post-processing mode, 80, the slicing was 80 seconds in situ and about 1,500 seconds with the post-processing. Um, so at 45K, the post-processing uh, I.O. was about 1,200 seconds and 12 terabytes. It's a lot of disk. It's a long time. Um, so the caveat is that for the post-processing um, runs, um, there were fewer ranks used, um, a 1 to 10. So they just used 10x fewer, which is typical. Um, still, even if you were to factor out that 10, it, um, 10x fewer um, resources, the in situ still is quite, quite fast compared to the post-processing. And I mean, that's largely, largely because of this IO cost are quite high. Um, so for real world science problems, we've got a couple use cases. Um, we have a CFD um, user in the science team um, they're running FOSTA um, from UC Boulder. It's a CFD code. They're trying to model boundary layer turbulence, build better airplane wings. Um, they coupled this to Sensei and ran um, 256,000 uh, ranks and 1 million MPI ranks on Argon. Um, they use the zero copy data transfer, um, but this is an unstructured mesh. And we saw when you're building an unstructured mesh, you have to have um, the cell, cell array, um, the cell offsets, the cell types, um, and the points themselves. And um, these arrays, the cell, um, the cell array, the offsets, and the cell types arrays, um, they need to make a full copy of this um, because the simulation actually represents that data differently than BTK does. Um, I think it may have been the ordering of the elements is not the same as um, what's used in BTK. So there is some memory overhead here in costs um, transferring that unstructured mesh. All of the their scalar arrays like um, such as um, the velocity field, for instance, pressure, those type of, those type of scalars were done zero copy. Um, so for a run this big, um, we, we did some you know, optimization of um, the executables because um, actually just starting up a program on a million nodes is quite taxing on the supercomputer and the file system. Um, Paraview itself is quite a, quite a large program. And it's typically um, the, the libraries are .so files. And when your program starts up, um, the dynamic loader uh, loads um, images of these .so files into memory. And that really taxes the disk. Um, we can 
you know, optimize that and make that a lot better by doing static linking. And that's a flag in the build um, of, of Paraview and Sensei. And when we do that, we get a bigger executable um, than we would otherwise, but there's, no, um, there's none of this overhead of, of hitting the disk when the executable starts up to load up these .so files. And Cray actually has optimized paths for shipping the executables around to the node when you do an srun. Um, and there are some actually options, um, at least on the NERSC system, that you can give srun to um, tell it to use this fast path to move the executables around. Um, so, yeah, sorry. I think this could be a good time to also say that uh, with Catalyst, there are the so-called Catalyst editions. Berlin mentioned the fact that Paraview itself is already a very large program, a very large library with many uh, shared library objects to load as the default. And there, is the so, the, there are the so-called editions where you can actually compile Catalyst with a reduced functionality. And there are, there are different levels. There's, there's the so-called essentials, which, are, which is really the bare minimum Paraview that you would need to do a Catalyst uh, connection. And then you can add several packages as you need in order to really minimize the, uh, the memory in the, the, the impact on the memory and on the loading time of shared object, as uh, Berlin just mentioned. So uh, if you run into that, prob that problem of too much uh, started, started time and memory consumption, we could also customize the uh, uh, Catalyst edition that we use for, for your purpose, OK? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very. That's a very good point. We have uh, the Kitware folks actually did that for these runs, yeah. um, and they also did this for VTK for us. Mm -hmm. So Sensei depends on VTK. VTK is also itself a very big library, um, but Sensei only needs the VTK data object, right? And you know some of the internal classes. So, anyways, in VTK, this just boils down to one VTK um, .so file. Basically, the I think it's the VTK data model .so or it's uh, oh, there's VTK common VTK and common VTK okay data model yeah it right, might be common two, yeah. and data yeah. model yeah. so we need these two these two objects but you can go into VTK in the build in the CMake and actually turn everything else off and so the Kitware folks did that and it made the VTK library that Sensei used extremely tiny for these runs and that um, that was actually how we did the 45k you know, core runs for our benchmarks with these really reduced VTK and Catalyst libraries. And um, also, by the way, Visit can do this as well. Um, and Brad Whitlock has put a lot of effort into making Visit compile statically and libsim like very small um, to help optimize with these things. Um, so in the end, Result they found in situ added um, for the different sizes they did. I guess in situ added um, 8.233 and 13 percent. They traced this down to Zlib PNG compression on rank zero of the rendered result. So it seems like it added some overhead, but um, if it if you're talking about the time to compress a PNG image, it's really not that much overhead. So the, the performance analysis focus areas are one-time costs, um, initialization, um, you know, for, this is where you know, library loading comes in. Um, the way Libsim works, it has an, a very kind of involved initialization process where it dynamically loads things in using DL open. Um, we looked at recurring costs, execution times, memory consumptions. These things are recurring because they happen every time the simulation state changes. You push data over, you know, to Sensei. Um, <clears throat> Finally, we we're taking a look at finalization. 
um, one-time costs, um, th shutting things down cleanly, cleaning up. Um, analyzing it this way gives you some, some insights in how you, how you can optimize. Um, and I know that you know, when, when we first looked at the, the benchmarks results, um, the initialization costs of all um, of the back ends, such as you know, Libsyn and Catalyst, were very high. And that's when we started looking at these, these additions, the Catalyst additions, the VTK additions, to kind of slim things way down, trim that down. Um, and Brad, Brad Whitlock actually did a bunch of hacking on visit to improve that. Um, you know, simulations are really concerned about performance and memory utilization, so it's important that we understand you know, these costs. Um, so the full paper, you know, and all of the results are, can be found there. Um, shared resources such as memory in between the sim and the, the in situ codes. Um, the initialization costs, again, need to be monitored. Um, Static builds are important. Um, initialization costs do get amortized. The longer you run, the less you're concerned about initialization costs. Um, finalization costs, I'm not so sure they're a huge fa um, factor for anything we did. Um, the usage of memory could potentially be an issue that you might want to be concerned about if you're caching a lot of stuff, buffering things. Like if you're doing a time domain analysis and you need to buffer a number of time steps, that's going to be you know, a factor um, that you're going to have to analyze. So you know, fine tuning the, the execution times. Um, you might be able to, you know, re if, you're, if the performance of the in situ is a, is a high uh, cost in your case, you might be able to lower the time fidelity but still get a better than uh, post hoc use case or turn on in situ only when something interesting is happening. Um, extracts can be used to reduce the output size. Um, images are, are, are often really small. And if you're doing you know, statistics, you're really dumping almost nothing. So that, that concludes the performance analysis, wrapping, wrapping things up. Um, why, should, why should we care about in situ? The flops versus IO issue. You know, IO, IO um, bandwidth is pretty static. Flops is going up quite dramatically. So in situ is important. That's a, one uh, solution for this problem. Um, so with this tutorial, we hope we you know, got you thinking about what are your options out uh, for in situ processing. Um, how are you going to interface your codes to them? And what are the performance issues to be thinking about? And here are links to all of the back ends. And that concludes uh, the slides we have. So it's 438. Yep. Do you have uh, conclusions or, or anything you want to Not in particular. Not add? How many 100 and some slides do we have? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was one precision. Uh, yesterday, I showed a small, ex uh, a, th a small number of slides in the afternoon, the early afternoon, which are not on the original deck. So I need to merge that back to the original, and I will create a new PDF of the, of the slides, OK? to make sure you have the complete uh, slide. Otherwise, uh, I think as far as the documentation for this workshop, 
we 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 are, we are all set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, conclusion is I want to I want to see you back here at CSCS with some efforts into uh, into applying those uh, in situ uh, techniques. Right. So this is uh, this should be just the beginning of this uh, exploration of the uh, the new technology. Uh, let's see. So we have 20 minutes until five, but mm -hmm. I think you're free to stay here a little bit longer, ask uh, ask general questions or more questions more specific to your own project, uh, in order to give everybody the freedom to come and go as they please. I think we need to make the official end of the the workshop now. And you, we cannot make an official end without thanking very much our, our speaker here uh, who came from California, because that's, a, that's really a big, uh, uh, what how should I say, a big effort in coming to CSCS. So You're thank very you very much, Beryl. You're very okay. welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. And I think it was well worth the effort. The effort wasn't bad. Give Heidi a hug for me. Okay. Um, and thank you so much. And I think we also need to acknowledge John because of his curiosity um, and exploring these new technologies um, and setting this whole thing up. I mean, I think it's really great. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right. So we'll close here. And then, of course, we're here until 5 o'clock. You, you're free to, uh, we can look at each other's uh, uh, desk here and talk about your specific needs, okay? Very good, thanks.